Have you ever like stopped and thought about how Google handles like billions of searches every single day? It's a crazy amount of data. Yeah. But there's this uh, surprisingly simple solution that helps keep everything running smoothly. Oh, really? What is it? What's their secret weapon? It's something called a bloom filter. And it's basically a clever little algorithm that acts like a super efficient cheat sheet for data. A cheat sheet. Yeah. That sounds interesting. But how does a cheat sheet manage that much information? Okay, so imagine you're a librarian with millions of books, but you only have a teeny tiny notepad. You couldn't possibly write down every single book. No. But you could like jot down enough clues to figure out whether a book is definitely not in the library. Okay, I think I get it. So instead of keeping track of all the data, a bloom filter just uses clues to rule out what's not there. You got it. And that's what makes it so powerful. It lets systems make decisions super fast without needing to store absolutely everything. That's really smart. But this has got to be a new invention, right? You might be surprised to learn that bloom filters have actually been around since the 1970s. Wow. Really? Yeah. Back then, computers were still pretty limited, right? Totally. Even basic computing was struggling with all the data back then. Memory was expensive, and there wasn't much of it. So they had to come up with something new to deal with all that. Exactly. Bloom filters came about because they needed to do more with less. So bloom filters were like a totally different way of thinking about data, prioritizing speed and efficiency over, like, being perfectly accurate. Exactly. And that's a key part of why they work so well. Instead of trying to be perfectly accurate, which would require tons of storage space, bloom filters use this clever combination of something called hash functions and a bit array. Okay, now you're going to have to explain that one. Hash functions, bit arrays, <laughs> I don't get it. All right, well, think of a hash function as a special kind of mathematical blender. You put data in, and it spits out this unique code that represents that data. So it's like a fingerprint for the data. Perfect analogy. And a bit array is basically a really, really long string of ones and zeros, like a giant light switch board. Okay, I'm picturing this huge light switch board. So how do those fingerprints and the light switch board work together in a bloom filter? When you add a piece of data to a bloom filter, its hash function makes that unique code or fingerprint, and that code decides which lights to flip on in the bit array. So it's like the bloom filter makes a simplified version of the data by turning on certain lights based on the fingerprint. Exactly. And the best part is that you can then use those same hash functions and the bit array to check if a new piece of data is probably in the set. Okay, I see. So you take the new data, make its fingerprint using the hash function, and then check if the lights are turned on in the bit array. Precisely. If all the right lights are on, there's a good chance the data's in the set. But if even one of those lights is off, then, you know, for sure it's not in the set. So it's a quick way to rule things out. Exactly. And that's where the good enough part comes in. There's a small chance of what we call a false positive, meaning the bloom filter might think an item is in the set when it's really not. Why would that happen, though? I thought the fingerprints were unique. They are, but there's only so many lights on the bit array. So it's possible that two different pieces of data with different fingerprints might accidentally flip on some of the same lights. So it's like two different people having similar fingerprints. Exactly. And that tiny chance of a false positive is the trade-off for how incredibly fast and efficient bloom filters are. It sounds like they were revolutionary back in the 70s. But are they still relevant today with all our fancy computers and massive data centers? Oh, absolutely. Bloom filters are a crucial part of tons of technology we use every single day. Really? I'd love to hear more about where they're used. But I think we're just about out of time for this part. Yeah, but don't worry. When we come back, we'll talk about how bloom filters are used in everything from spell checkers to the internet itself. Stay tuned. Welcome back. So before the break, we were talking about bloom filters, those awesome algorithms that are like cheat sheets for data. They're pretty cool, huh? Yeah. I'm ready to hear how these things are actually used. Well, one of the first big uses for bloom filters was in spell checkers. Spell checkers? Yep. Really? That doesn't seem very high tech. I know it sounds kind of basic now, but back then it was a huge deal. Imagine trying to check every single word you type against this massive dictionary. It would have taken forever. But bloom filters found a really smart way to do it. So how do they make spell checkers faster? Well, instead of storing the entire dictionary, a bloom filter could hold all the correctly spelled words in this compact way. So when you typed a word, the spell checker could quickly check the bloom filter to see if the word was likely spelled right. And if it wasn't, the spell checker would flag it as a possible misspelling. That's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing bloom filters didn't stop at spell checkers though, right? You're right. They quickly found their way into the heart of the internet. 
playing a crucial role in how networks handle all the information flowing through them. Networks? What do bloom filters have to do with that? Think about it. Managing networks means keeping track of a ton of IP addresses. Those unique codes that let devices talk to each other online. It's like a giant phone book for the internet. Exactly. Yeah. And if you had to look up every address in those tables every time, it would be super slow. Bloom filters help speed that process up big time. So routers, the things that direct internet traffic, they could use bloom filters to quickly check if an IP address was likely to be in their tables. Exactly. Instead of doing a full search for every single packet of data, they could use bloom filters to rule out a lot of addresses right away, making everything faster and more efficient. Makes sense. So where else are Bloom filters used today? They're everywhere. Databases to speed up searches, bioinformatics to compare DNA sequences, cybersecurity to spot potentially dangerous websites, you name it. Wow, that's incredible. It's amazing how such a simple idea has had such a huge impact. So this isn't just some nerdy computer science thing. It really affects everyone, right? Absolutely. Every time you search on Google, a bloom filter is probably helping to narrow down the results. And when you're browsing the web, bloom filters might be blocking those annoying pop-up ads or even stopping you from visiting bad websites. Wow, so they're really important even though most people don't even know about them. But haven't bloom filters changed since the 70s? Of course. They've been getting refined and improved over the years, leading to some really cool new versions. Like what? What are some of the new things people are doing with bloom filters? Well, one thing about the original bloom filter is that you can't delete things. Once you add something to the filter, it's stuck there. So how do you deal with that if you need to remove data? Like in a database, it's constantly changing. Well, that's where the counting bloom filter comes in. Instead of a simple bit array, it uses counters. So when you add something, you increase the counter, and when you remove something, you decrease it. So it's like keeping track of how many times something appears instead of just whether it's there or not. That's cool. But what if you don't know how much data you'll be working with? Can Bloom filters handle that? That's a great question. And it leads us to scalable Bloom filters. They can actually grow as you add more data kind of like adding extra lanes to a highway to handle more traffic. So you don't have to know how much data you'll have ahead of time. The bloom filter can just adjust as you go. You got it. That flexibility is a big part of why they're still so useful. Yeah. But we were talking about those false positives earlier, right? Is there any way to make those less likely? Definitely. And this is where things get really interesting. Researchers have been using machine learning to create learned bloom filters. They use machine learning models to make better guesses about whether data is in the set. So they're like smarter bloom filters. You could say that. And they work really well. Learned bloom filters can be way more efficient and have a much lower chance of false positives than traditional ones. That's amazing. But you know what? I think we need to take a short break. When we come back, we'll talk about the ethics of using bloom filters and what the future might hold for them. Don't go anywhere. Welcome back to the deep dive. We've been learning all about bloom filters. It's amazing how important they are. Right. It just goes to show you the power of a good algorithm. Yeah. And how they're like working behind the scenes, shaping the world around us. Yeah. And before the break, we were talking about all these new kinds of bloom filters, like the counting ones and the ones that use machine learning. It seems like they're keeping up with all the changes in technology. Oh, absolutely. And that brings us to some really exciting future possibilities. One area where bloom filters could have a big impact is in quantum computing. Quantum computing. That sounds like science fiction. I know, right? But it's a real thing, and it has huge potential information. Quantum computers can do calculations in a totally different way than regular computers, and that opens up a whole new world for bloom filters. So how would a quantum bloom filter even work? Well, it's still pretty early days, but the idea is to use quantum mechanics stuff like superposition and entanglement to make bloom filters that can handle massive amounts of data super fast. So instead of just ones and zeros, a quantum bloom filter would be using something totally different. Exactly. It would use quantum bits or quibits. They can be in multiple states at the same time, which lets them do things in parallel that regular computers just can't. Wow. So what could we use these quantum bloom filters for? One area where they could be really important is in cryptography especially for making encryption that can withstand quantum computers. Because as quantum computers get more powerful, there's a worry that they could break the encryption we use today. So quantum bloom filters could help keep our data safe from these super powerful quantum computers. Exactly. They could be used to check if encryption keys are legitimate, making sure communication stays secure even in a world with quantum computers. That's good to know. 
But are there any problems with this technology? I mean, building a quantum bloom filter can't be easy. You're right. Quantum computing is still pretty new, and there are definitely challenges. One big one is dealing with errors. Quantum computers are super sensitive, and it's hard to keep those qibits stable. So making sure the quantum bloom filter is accurate would be really important, especially for something like encryption, where a mistake could be a big deal. Absolutely. And then there's the problem of making them bigger. Building quantum computers that can handle huge data sets is a huge challenge. So it sounds like quantum bloom filters have amazing potential, but we're not quite there yet. But even looking past quantum computing, what's the future for bloom filters in general? Will they still be around in the future or will something better come along? That's a great question. And it's tough to predict the future of technology, but I think bloom filters will be important for a long time. Why do you think that? Because they're simple, efficient, and adaptable. And as we create more and more data, we're going to need solutions like plume filters even more. So even though they've been around for over 50 years, they're still going strong. It's amazing how something so simple can have such a big impact. It really is. And as we've seen, gloom filters haven't just stuck around. They've led to all sorts of new data structures and techniques. They've changed the way we think about managing data. It makes you wonder what other simple ideas are out there just waiting to be discovered. Well, I think that about wraps up our deep dive into bloom filters. We've covered a lot, from how they work to how they're used, and even what the future might hold for them. It's been great exploring this with you. Hopefully this deep dive has sparked your curiosity and given you a new appreciation for algorithms and how they affect our lives. It definitely has for me. And to our listeners, we encourage you to keep exploring, keep learning, and keep asking questions. Until next time, keep diving deep.